The scenes on the streets of Khartoum today were initially those of celebration, a taste of what freedom might feel like, and all recorded for posterity on a mobile phone. News that Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir had been ousted was delivered by his old ally, the Defense Minister, Lieutenant General Ahmed Awad bin Auf. I announced the toppling of the regime, he's saying, and the detaining of its chief in a secure place. Those not already on the streets rushed outside to celebrate. To see al-Bashir stepping down is enough for us, says this woman. Oh, our young people, this is such a joy. But perhaps a short-lived one. Many Sudanese, say analysts, see the general as a mirror of the man he just deposed. He's someone who, as a political leader, as much as an army leader, is part of the deep state in Sudan. He is part of the network uh, that President Bashir has built up over the last 30 years to, to insulate his government. There are many on the streets crying foul, calling the coup a charade designed to save al-Bashir, not oust him. Fadia Halaf is a protester reached by the CBC today. We're going to carry on protesting. We do not want to recycle the same regime over and over again. That's impossible. Al-Bashir himself came to power in a military coup in 1989, enduring for decades despite being accused of genocide in Darfur in the 2000s by the International Criminal Court in The Hague. The protests leading to his apparent downfall today began in December, over the price of bread. The civil society groups that have led them are now calling on people to stay on the streets, to keep protesting until they win a civilian transition to democracy. The protests will go on, says this man, until the Sudanese people are assured their revolution will not be stolen from them. Much now will depend on how the army reacts if the people do stay on the streets. The battle for Sudan's future still unfolding. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. According to Statistics Canada, more than 10,000 people from Sudan live in this country. We spoke to a couple of them whose stories explain why what's happening there hits very close to home. I left Sudan in July of the year 2000. I was 12 years old when I left. I left Sudan in 2003. I forced to leave the country because I get, I get threat. If you're not leaving, your life it will be in danger. The, the terror that I remember most was a day when I was watching TV with my dad um, and then uh, we heard a knock on the door and he was people from the security forces and they'd come to confiscate my dad's truck and that was the day that they ordered him to shut down his business um, and, and hearing that knock on the door uh, was a terrifying moment. I'm a leader in, uh, in the student union when I was in the university. We, I get arrested there I um, I've been there for two weeks. Tortures. I get beaten with the uh, with uh, sticks, and also they take us all the clothes, only with the underwear, and then they start putting uh, uh, the. They put uh, the cigarettes, pads, you know, our body. And I, I still I have in my skin the, I have the, uh, the torture in my skin. This, I still have the mark. I saw my dad's anger at um, just how repressive the regime was. It's a very bad time in my life. So there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of hope that the people who are protesting are able to affect change. But there's also kind of like, this, this moment of confusion of what was, uh, was this all for if it's just going to be a military dictatorship for the next two years. Bashir is, is God. Yes, we are happy. We're not only calling for a person. This is the state. This is a country. This is our life, our people's life, and the change will happen and will happen soon. With so much uncertainty in Sudan right now, Global Affairs Canada is warning people to stay away. It says the security situation could deteriorate quickly and is advising against all travel. 
The Canadian Embassy in Khartoum has also been closed until further notice.